My name is Giles and uh, I'm a mass spectrometrist. So what that means is I use mass spectrometers, which are these gadgets here, to determine the molecular weight of molecules. So the reason why this has been sort of whirring away and making all this noise is, um, is because it's got a very high vacuum system. So inside here we have a couple of turbo molecular pumps which are spinning around at 60,000 revs a minute. And then underneath there's, an, there's another pump underneath which is like a, a big Dyson vacuum cleaner which sort of sucks away all of the air which comes down from these turbo molecular pumps and then it just exhausts out of the back. So there's lots of power supplies in there, high voltage power supplies, uh, high vacuum, some hot temperatures, um, high voltages. So um, the talk today is basically um, what does mass spectrometry have to do with me or have to do with you guys? Because you probably haven't seen a mass spectrometer. Well, you, may, you probably have seen them, but you might not have noticed them. So there's a lot of mass spectrometry that goes, a lot, goes on behind the scenes. So they do have a big part to play in your daily lives. So if I just move the... Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you... This is just a quick overview. So I'm going to tell you what a mass spectrum is. So that's the output from a mass spectrometer. It's going to be a bit of a chemistry lesson to start with, just to sort of get you up to speed with all the, um, the terminology. So I'm going to start quite basic with what an atom is, an element, and isotopes. Um, and I'm going to talk to you, well, describe what the periodic table is. Uh, this is a very important table we have. Uh, what molecules are, what ionization is, uh, if it's going to go on, hang a minute, I'm just waiting for this to advance. All right, here's some ionization. So ionization usually involves high voltage of some kind, some description. Um, what is a mass spectrometer? So that's, so I'll give you a brief description of what this gadget here is. Uh, there it is. And I'm going to give you a brief history of mass spectrometry, so where it all originated from. Um, it wasn't with Roy Castle and Cheryl Baker, uh, but I will uh, go through some mass spectrometry world records, which you may find interesting, and some mass spectrometry applications, which affect you guys. And then we'll have a practical session. Okay, so moving swiftly on. So first of all, what is a mass spectrum? This is a very simple mass spectrum I found of some gases inside a mass spectrometer. So what we have is intensity, so it's a graph plot, versus mass. Now these are some, well, four of the most common um, elements in biological organisms. So carbon has a mass of 12, hydrogen has a mass of 1, oxygen 16, nitrogen 14. So we can see on the spectrum it's detected some hydrogen, H2, so there's a peak at, at um, 2. There's also some, some hydrogen on its own. There's a peak at 12 for the carbon. There's some H2O, there's some carbon monoxide nit and nitrogen. They have the same mass. And there's also some carbon dioxide. So if we look at the masses, so we've got the different masses here. So water, because it's one oxygen and two hydrogens, it's 16 plus two ones, which makes 18. Uh, nitrogen is two 14s, which makes 28. And then the carbon dioxide, it's a 12 plus two 16s, which adds up to 44. Now the problem with this mass spectrum here is we have carbon monoxide and nitrogen, which have the same mass. So they're actually called isobaric. And with this particular mass spectrometer which analysed this air, it's not actually, it hasn't got high enough resolution to resolve these two peaks. There is a slight mass difference, but we won't get into that at the moment. So, um, are there any chemists among you? Does anyone? Or does anyone know what an atom is? Okay, right. Okay, that's good, sort of. So, here's an atom. Um, so this is, I don't think atoms really look like this, but this is a common sort of model of an atom, if you like. So we've got a nucleus in the middle with electrons which whiz around the outside, or really form a cloud. 
So in the middle, in the nucleus, we've got protons and neutrons. So the protons have a positive charge and a mass of one, a uh, positive charge of one as well. Neutrons have no charge and also a mass of one. And then whizzing around the outside, we have electrons, which have a negative charge of one. This is equal but opposite to the charge on the proton, but they, their mass is um, almost 2,000 times less than that of a proton. So the number of protons in your atom defines what the atom is. So if we move on to, uh, oh, also the mass of a proton is equal to 1.67 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. So in order to weigh a proton, which is essentially the mass of a hydrogen, because a hydrogen is just one proton and one electron, you need a device that can measure to that level of accuracy. So that's the full um, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 24. So then we move on to elements. So we have hydrogen, which is one proton, so that's an atomic number of one. Carbon has six protons, six neutrons. Nitrogen has seven, and oxygen has eight. We'll see that in more detail when we move on to the periodic table. But the other thing, when, when we start looking at molecules, we need to know how these atoms join together. So hydrogen forms one bond, so it has one hand that it can hang on to other atoms. Carbon forms four bonds. Nitrogen forms three bonds, usually. Oxygen forms two bonds. So that's why with our water we have H2O. So the oxygen has two hands and it holds on to two hydrogens. So this symbol DA here is uh, the symbol Dalton, which is named after John Dalton, who was one of the pioneers in developing atomic theory. And he was uh, born in Manchester. And like I said before, these four elements are the most common elements in living organisms, so they're very important. Right, I'm going to have to mention isotopes. So I'm going to use carbon as an example here. You may have heard of carbon dating. Uh, I'm going to run through that in some more detail later. But essentially, all the carbon in our um, universe, uh, well, all the carbon on our planet, let's say, is most, the vast majority is carbon-12. So about 99% is carbon-12, 1% is carbon-13, and then there's a, few, there's a background level of, in parts per trillion of carbon-14, which is actually radioactive, and that's formed in the atmosphere. So we had uh, Frederick Soddy and Soddy and Francis Aston. Now they both won Nobel Prizes for chemistry. Uh, for their work on isotopes. And then we had James Chadwick, who was awarded a Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of neutrons. So the main issue here, I should have mentioned this before, if you look at all of these atoms of carbon, or these isotopes, they're all carbon because they've all got six protons, but they've got a different number of neutrons. Okay? So chemically they're identical because they've got six protons and six electrons, but they have a different number of neutrons. They weigh a different amount, but they're chemically identical. So now we move on to the periodic table. Now this is quite an amazing um, table. It was a discovery. Now it was basically, Dmitry Mendeleev published his version of the periodic table in 1869, and all he did, he arranged, this is before he had a mass spectrometer or anything, but he basically grouped the, uh, the, the elements in groups of similar properties and increasing mass. And if you look here, the atomic number, it goes across 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So as the atomic number increases, you increase the number of protons in your atom. So the periodic table that Mendeleev put together was had lots of holes in it because the, many of these elements hadn't actually been discovered yet. And so as the elements were discovered, they filled all the gaps in the periodic table. And this was even done long before we had mass spectrometry, and it's quite amazing that everything fitted together, and then, they discovered, then the mass spectrometer was invented and all the masses lined up, and it was, well, it's pretty amazing. Um, so the chemical elements are ordered by the atomic number. The small, the number underneath, this is the atomic weight. So 
sometimes you have different numbers of neutrons, so that's why the, the weight is not equal to the atomic number. Incidentally, anything larger than lead is radioactive. All of these ad elements fall apart, and all of these ones along the bottom here are man-made. So these are made by just bombarding atoms with neutron beams, hoping that something is going to stick and you're going to create a new element and, and there's a nuclear fusion reaction to, to create an, a new element. So this is a picture of Mendeleev. So, yeah, very clever man. Um, big beard. Okay. <laughs> um, the other thing I was going to say about the aliens. Now, I, I, you know, I think there are aliens out there. But I believe the aliens have the same periodic table. It's just a logical way of organizing all of the elements. So if, you, if you're in this universe, you're going to have the same elements, and they're going to be ordered in that way, so we can communicate with them in terms of our chemistry. But only 4.9% of the matter that we can detect in this universe is ordinary matter. Now this the rest of it is dark matter and dark energy and we don't really know much about that at all. So this is where our elements came from. So this is a periodic table here. So the hydrogen and helium, they came from the Big Bang. Various other elements came from cosmic rays, uh, large stars, small stars. And that's what we know from the, the chemistry. This is a pie chart of the matter in our universe. So with our mass spectrometer, we can only detect the ordinary matter. I don't think this stuff's going to work in our mass spectrometer. But it's only 4.9%. And the reason we know that is um, because a spaceship went out, or a satellite, the, the Planck Space Observatory. Uh, there's a picture of it. And it went out and it monitored the cosmic microwave background. And from that, we determined the average density of the ordinary and the dark matter within the universe. It also gave us an accurate age of the universe, which is about 13.7 billion years, give or minus, uh, plus or minus 200 million years. Right, so molecule, here's some molecules. So do you know what the first one is? That's water. Second one, methane. Third one, alcohol. So in order to determine the mass, well, we can just basically add them up. So if I give you the, the masses here, the water weighs 18, the methane weighs 16, and the alcohol, if we add up all the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, comes to 46. So if we put these in a mass spectrometer, we should be able to determine the mass of those molecules. Now, all molecules and atoms are neutral. They have no overall charge. Uh, everything around us is pretty much neutral unless it's got electricity flowing through it or it's an ion. So an ion is basically a molecule or an atom that has an overall positive or negative charge. So I'm only, there's many different means of ionization. I'm only going to talk about electrospray ionization because that's what we're using on this mass spectrometer here. And what that does, that protonates a molecule. So it sticks a proton onto a molecule. So if we, this is our molecule here. We add a proton. So hydrogen is just one proton and one electron. If we take an electron away, H plus is actually a proton. Give it some ionization, and then we go to make a protonated molecule. So this is our M plus H. So it'll be the mass of the molecule plus one. Now the main take home message about the ions is if you have a, an ion, you can move it around with a magnetic field or an electrostatic field. So you can, it's all about the Fleming's left and right hand rule, if you remember those from your physics lessons. But basically the mass spectrometer, through a series of uh, voltages, it can move ions and fly the ions through the, through the instrument. So the mass spectrometer is not working with light or anything, it's actually flying the ions through the system and then they fly through and hit the detector at the end. So what is a mass spectrometer? Okay, here's a nice simple explanation. So, first of all, you have to create ions. So, there's three main components. So, you create ions in the ion source. So, on this instrument, it's on the front. This bit, I can pull that off in a second, show it to you. Uh, we then have a mass analyzer, which separates out the, the ions according to their mass. And then we need some kind of means of detection at the end. 
So the mass spectrometer also must operate under high vacuum. So in this system, we've got the two turbo molecular pumps spinning at 60,000 revs a minute. So these are like jet engines. And then we have a mechanical pump underneath, which sucks everything out. So these actually work on a sort of probability if some, if some air molecules hit the blades, they just get knocked to the bottom of the pump. And then the pump at the bottom here sucks them away. So here's a cross section of our mass spectrometer, the same as this one. So we've got the electrospray ion source at the front, we've got the mass analyzers, the detector at the end, the vacuum system with the scroll pump underneath, ion source, the ions move through. We've actually got two mass analyzers in this one. So we've got a mass analyzer, then a collision cell, another mass analyzer, and at the end we have the detector, which basically sees the ions. Now, the detector doesn't know what it's seeing. It just detects something is hitting it. So we need, the, the, the detector needs to be synced with the mass analyzer. So when it's plotting its graph, it needs to know what mass it is looking at. So um, I'm just going to give you a very brief history of mass spectrometry. So it started with this guy, JJ. Uh, so um, John Joseph Thompson determined the mass of the electron first with a cathode ray tube. So we had a cathode ray tube, it's an electron gun, shooting it down a, an evacuated tube. And he had a couple of plates here. Because the electron is a charged particle, he could move, deflect the, ion, the, the electron beam up and down. And depending on what voltage he puts on here, he deflects it by a certain amount. And depending on that and some clever maths, he could actually determine the mass of an electron, which is pretty small. He was instrumental in developing the first mass spectrometer. So this is shooting negative particles from a cathode. He must have just reversed the polarities and started shooting positive particles. So if this was full of neon gas, he's going to be ionizing his neon. The neon positive, because these were electrons, the positive neon is going to be flying down. And the first instrument he made was a mass spectrograph. So if you imagine the end of this um, bulb here, this is covered in a phosphor, phosphor paint. So when um, an iron or an electron hits it, it you, give a you get a scintillation and you get, uh, a, it will light up, so like an old TV screen. So you can put a photographic plate in there and the ions were deflected with a, with a magnet for this mass spectrometer. And so different ions of different masses were deflected. So he's actually, so he's got some, uh, some neon here, some carbon dioxide and some carbon monoxide. This is a replica of Thompson's and Aston's third mass spectrometer. They weren't happy with this mass spectrograph because it's a bit hard to interpret. So what they did, rather than using this as the output, they focused the iron beam through a, a couple of slits and then they had a detector. So as they changed the magnet power, they're letting the lightweight mass ions go through first and the medium mass ions then the heavy ions. So as it's scanning across from low mass to high mass, as something hits the detector on their chart record, it can plot uh, a peak. So this is actually a mass spectrum of some carbon monoxide, the first mass spectrum, which looks pretty good compared to uh, you know, when they were doing it. Uh, JJ won a Nobel Prize in 1906. Um, he did lots of work on uh, gases and was the grandfather of mass spectrometry. So now we'll just look at some applications. So we had the Olympics recently. So there's lots of uh, drugs of a well, they're not really drugs, performance-enhancing drugs. So in the 2012 Olympics at King's College London, there was a whole room full of these mass spectrometers that tested all the athletes. Um, so this was one of the main products, Waters, because I used to work for the company that made this. They had all, nearly all the mass spectrometers in there were Waters ones. Uh, not only for humans, also in horses. Uh, the chemical industry. They uh, use mass spectrometers, so if, they make, if you're making something, you want to know what you've made, use a mass spectrometer, it'll tell you what you've made to a certain extent. Uh, food security, so a lot of, we're lucky in this country, our food gets screened, in, for food that's imported and exported. And then I suppose the largest, uh, well, the pharmaceutical industry, drugs, you know, it's a heavy, heavily regulated environment. And there's also clinical applications, screening for natural products, you name it. Um, but the main thing about the mass spectrometer is it's very fast, so it's got high speed, high selectivity, and high sensitivity. So it's, I think it's one of the most 
I think it is the most sensitive analytical instrument we've got. And by selectivity, I mean you can distinguish between different masses. So neonatal screening, um, anyone who's born uh, from the mid, well, let me think, late 90s onwards would have been screened with a mass spectrometer in this country. And we can screen for many different diseases, which are basically expressed by the lack of certain metabolites. So this, um, if, if you're missing this enzyme, medium chain acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase deficiency. So if you're missing this enzyme, you can't metabolize the fats. And, it, and basically, if it doesn't get picked up soon, uh, your child could die. So we're very lucky in this country. All of our children are screened. In America, they're all screened if you pay your medical insurance. Uh, a lot of countries in the world, they're not screened. So this, this is all the, all the, the uh, neonatal screening centers in the country, and they all use water's mass spectrometers as well. So food security, this is a nice image I got from the, the Museum of Carrots website. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure their carrots are all fine. Um, but basically, we need to screen our food for pesticides. Um, there's lots of pesticides which are not good for us. Mass spectrometer, very fast, high selectivity, can screen for hundreds of pesticides in less than 10 minutes. It can detect up to, well, hundredths of a milligram, a thousandth of a milligram in a kilogram of carrots. So that's a, if you just imagine that much pesticide in a kilogram of carrots, they're extremely sensitive instruments. And this is just showing a, uh, it's actually a chromatogram with a, a series of um, pesticides which have been detected. So if you do detect some pesticides, your carrots won't go to market. You won't be able to sell them. You won't be able to export them. So not every carrot gets tested, but batches of carrots will be tested. Security screening. I don't know, has anyone seen one of these before? In the, in the airport, every time you go through the airport, after you put your, your, your bags in the x-ray, there'll be one of these at the end of the x-ray. Now this is a, um, a simple iron mobility mass spectrometer and if you're unlucky enough to, ge to be t pulled to one side they'll get a, one of these dusters, they'll dust you, they'll dust your bag and they'll shove it in here. The sample gets thermally desorbed and, uh, and this is the inside of the mass spectrometer. It's basically it's an iron mobility mass spectrometer. So you've got some, uh, some drift gas which is blowing through this tube here. The, uh, the sample gets sucked in here. This one is actually ionising it with um, some radioactive uh, nickel. The ions fly down this drift tube and depending on the mass of the ions, they have a different drift time. And the drift time is proportional to the mass. So the, the system has a library inside it and if, uh, if the drift time corresponds to a, an explosive or a narcotic, it will ring an alarm and then you'll get taken to one side and then they'll get a better sample and put you through a decent mass spectrometer and you might well, I don't know, you might go to prison, I guess. Um, right, so I'll just go through some other applications. Carbon dating, this is a large accelerator mass spectrometer. These are usually state, you know, like government institutions, government facilities, because it's quite large. Uh, so we use this to determine the age of uh, organic material. So carbon-14 is uh, generated in the atmosphere. So we have nitrogen in the atmosphere with seven protons and seven neutrons, some cosmic rays, and it goes to carbon-14, so it changes the number of protons. So it's going, this is a, a nuclear reaction, it's going from one element to another. There's a bit of alchemy going on, but it has the same mass, because protons and neutrons weigh the same, so they both weigh 14. The carbon-14 is radioactive, and as it's produced, it will go decay back to nitrogen. So this is the isotopic ratios of our carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. It's only parts per trillion levels, so it's very sensitive. But, well, not a lot of it around. Um, basically, the ions are accelerated through the mass spectrometer and it separates them into carbon-12, 13, and 14. And it measures the isotopic ratio. So what happens, so the way it works is the carbon-14 uh, gets turned into it gets exchanged with the carbon in the atmosphere, which is carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is absorbed by grass in a process called photosynthesis. So now the carbon-14 is locked in the grass. The grass gets eaten by an animal, a cow. Or well, this could make a tree, if you like. And then the cow dies, uh, poor cow. 
um, someone finds a bone, they dig up the bone, and then they measure how much carbon-14 is in it. And if they measure uh, the, the amount of carbon-14, it's basically going to tell you how much of it is left. Because once the cow's dead, it can't exchange any carbon from the atmosphere anymore. So the carbon-14 only comes from the atmosphere. So any carbon-14 that's in the bone is going to basically disappear. And if you can measure the amount of carbon-14, you can determine the age, because the half-life of the carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So that means half the amount of carbon-14 is going to disappear every 5,730 years. So this method of dating is good for up to about um, 60,000 years. So we'll go through a few um, mass spectrometry world records. Do you know, do you know what the time is? How, how long have I got? Ten minutes. OK, uh, right, so we, these are all in the mass spectrometry Guinness uh, Book of Records. Unfortunately, we haven't got any mass spectrometers in the world record book yet. So we've got the longest running mass spectrometer. This is one that was at University of Manchester. We've got Grenville Turner, who was born in Todmorden. Now, he aged all of the lunar samples brought back from the Apollo missions. Um, and this mass spectrometer, well, he, he built it in Sheffield, then it moved to Manchester. I've seen it up and running. Unfortunately, it's, it's not running at the moment, but it was running for about 50 years, which is, I think, a world record. Uh, I've, I've asked people around the world about this, and I think it is the longest running mass spectrometer. Best travelled mass spectrometers. So this is the uh, Rosetta space mission. So there was two mass spectrometers on this. There was a, the um, uh, Ptolemy and Cossack, and they travelled more than 1,000 million kilometres, and they were actually on the, um, on the Philae lander. So then they travelled onto the comet and they measured the amino acids and the elemental composition on the comet. Largest iron, excuse me, uh, largest iron measured. This is a bit biology, but biologists do use mass spectrometers. So this is a, a viral uh, virus, 17,900 kilodaltons. Um, world's lightest, this is a handheld device. Uh, 1.8 kilograms with a battery, pretty good only consumes five watts of power um, and that includes the vacuum system and everything. This was done in 2008. This is the, I think this is still the, the world record. And this is detecting a, this is a precursor for sarin gas. So again, this is like for use for what the Americans call homeland security. Uh, there's a picture here. I'll just go back to that picture. This is uh, Stephen Hawkins. I'm, I'm sure he's not a member of the Illuminati, but um, Mass spectrometers do get used for some dodgy applications as well. So the biggest mass spectrometer, this one, this is a, a, the, used in the Manhattan Project. So they actually use the mass spectrometer to separate out the isotopes of uranium, to purify the uranium. And because there was a, a shortage of copper in, in the war, they used 13,000 tonnes of silver for their electromagnets. And this actually, so the, the ions of uranium were flying around this mass spectrometer and collected on a metal plate. And they actually collected 64 kilograms of pure uranium-235. And the uranium-235 is, the atomic, atomic ratio is less than a percent. It's a small amount. So the amount of uranium-238 that went through that is probably tons. Uh, longest relationship between man and mass spectrometer. This is my friend Jakob John. So he had a mass spectrometer in 1980, and he's been running it ever since. This mass spectrometer here is going to go to Jakob John. They've got quite a few mass spectrometers. This is in Pakistan, Karachi. And now we get onto our system here, the Zevo. Usually this is, has another instrument with it called a chromatograph. And what that does, it uh, separates out a mixture. So we have our sample in solution. I'm just in the interest of time, I'm just going to run through this. Um, so the ionisation source, this is a needle which ends there and this is another needle here. So we have nitrogen gas nebulising the solution out of here. This is all at high voltage, about 5,000 volts or 3,500. This is a Taylor cone. This is here. This is, uh, this is where the ionisation occurs. So the sample's nebulised out. We have hot nitrogen gas coming around the outside and the ions go into the orifice of the mass spectrometer and then they can be manipulated by the electronics inside. So John Fenn got a uh, Nobel Prize for this. Uh, it's, it's a huge breakthrough. 
This is a quadrupole mass analyzer. This is how this instrument separates out the ions. Um, so what we have is radio frequency and direct currents applied to four molybdenum rods. The ions travel through the rods, and when a low voltage is applied, we have a stable trajectory for the low mass ions. And when a high voltage is applied, we have uh, a stable trajectory for the high mass ions. So again, there was another Nobel Prize for this by Wolfgang uh, Paul. So this is the RF, which is ramping up and down as the mass spectrometer scans from low mass to high mass. So this is a mass spectrum here. So at a, uh, at a low voltage, we have a stable trajectory for the low mass ions. For a medium voltage, we have a stable trajectory for the medium mass ions. And for a high voltage, we have a stable trajectory for the high mass ions. So the mass spectrometer scans from low mass to high mass all the time in a sawtooth fashion but it can scan up to 10,000, these are called mass units, it can scan up to 10,000 mass units in a second. So it can do this exceedingly fast. And this little space here is just the inter-scan delay, just for the electronics to reset. So this is our mass spectrometer here. We have two quadrupoles and a collision cell in the middle. And then at the end, we have our detector. So we'll just get onto our practical session. I've got some paracetamol and some diazepam. <laughs> Okay, so what I'll do, I'll just get this going quickly. So, I'll just switch it on. So at the moment, what I've got going through this is just some... Um, shall I put some more solution in it? This is just a... Um, this, these are the, the masses at the bottom. Actually, perhaps if I just get rid of, this is the vacuum here. Uh, this, the, the top here, this is the, um, for the electrospray capillary. And so the, and this, oh, hang on a minute, let me just get rid of this. Uh, that's injured. So here, so this is our mass spectrum. Actually, let's just go straight for the paracetamol. I'll just get some of that in it. So if you look at the paracetamol molecule there, you'll see that um, there's eight carbons, nine hydrogens, and nitrogen and oxygen. So all of these carbon corners here are carbons. You can add up the carbons, the hydrogens, and this is a benzene ring. So we've actually got hydrogen here on each of these corners. So that all adds up. And what we're going to do, we're going to protonate it and stick a proton on there. And, uh, and after we've done that, we should see 151 plus um, 1, which is 152. Where's our mass 152? It doesn't want to come through, does it? Let's give it a bit of encouragement. So I'm just turning the heat up now. Uh, let's give it a bit more gas. No, this is the wrong one. Oh, no. Paracetamol's in here, isn't it? Sorry, that was a different uh, chemical. Just, uh yeah, I'm using this syringe pump here just because it's um, the flu. It's got 
inbuilt fluidics on the front so it can suck its own samples in, but it just takes a while. That's my paracetamol sample. Oh, there's some coming through now. There we go. I think it might. There's some paracetamol. A little bit there. Uh, what we can do though, if we just get it on a spectrum. How long? How long have I got? Just another couple of minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, right, let's just have a look on this. So if I just put, set this uh, mass here is the mass in the middle of the screen. So if I set it to about mass 80, so 80 is going to go in the middle. And I increase the span to uh, 140, we should be able to see. Oh, there is our paracetamol at the end there. I'm going to try a stronger sample actually. Let's try this one. I think this is a lot more concentrated. This is the diazepam. <laughs> See, I was a bit scared of putting too much in there because this is such a sensitive um, system and I didn't have any. I should have prepared some samples at university, but. What's the mass of the diazepam? That's Right, here we go. There's our diazepam. So, um, now the diazepam, we've got four peaks there. Uh, I'll just explain why we've got four peaks. If you look at the, um, uh, at the, uh, the molecule here, we've got a chlorine um, atom. And chlorine has two isotopes. One of them is chlorine 37, and one of them is chlorine 35. And so what we have, this peak here is the M plus H with the chlorine 35 and this is the M plus H with the chlorine 37. Okay now these other little peaks here are due to the carbon isotope. Now uh, do you remember we we're telling you about carbon you've got carbon 12 which is about 99% carbon 12 and 1% is carbon 13. So if you just had a molecule with one carbon like methane you're going to have two peaks for the methane, you're going to have one peak at 99% and another peak at 1%. So one peak is for the carbon 12, the other is for the carbon 13. Now if you look at this molecule here, we've got about uh, how 13, uh, no sorry, 16 carbons. So, and if, if they all make up 1%, so this, uh, basically we're going to have about 16% of these ions are going to be carbon 13. So, that's, so this is the carbon 13 peak for chlorine 35 and this is the um, uh, the carbon 13 peak for the chlorine 37 and what we could try and do is just fragment it so now we have this um, we've got the, the peaks here they're looking quite nice I'll just show you what this does this is the capillary voltage if we turn this down this is the ionization so this is the high voltage on the ionization so if we kill the high voltage we stop the ionization uh, we've also got, this is the mass resolution here. Now with the quadrupole it's using radio frequency 
and direct current. And the, rad the ratio of the radio frequency to the direct current is about 10 to 1. So we can change the ratio. And if we do that, we can make the peaks fatter or thinner. So this is our mass resolution, our mass resolving power. But you don't get something for nothing. So if we increase the resolution, uh, we get less sensitivity. We've also, the ions have to move through the system. So this is, we have to give them some iron energy. So this is, so everything is going from a high potential energy to a low potential energy. So at the moment we've got an iron energy of about 0.3. We try and make them go backwards, they're not going to go backwards. And if we push them through the quadrupole too much, we get what's chicken head peaks. So basically the ions are going through the quadrupole too fast and they're not, um, they haven't got enough cycles of RF to be properly resolved. So you have to keep, the ions are travelling through here at about um, 300 metres per second, something like that. So they're travelling through quite quickly. Um, we could just have a quick go at fragmenting this. So, and then, so what we'll do, we'll set it up for a door to scan. So if this is our parent here, at mass 285. So this is the mass of our parent, 285. So we've got two quadrupoles and a collision cell. So if we do a daughter scan, the first quadrupole will only let through the parents. So it's only mass 285. And then we can scan the daughters. <coughs> 